I'm here with Gary Thor Wado, one of our most popular conductors and a good friend. Gary, how great to see you. How are you doing? I'm great, and I'm so happy to see you, Frank. You have no idea. I'm, I'm so grateful to be part of the BCI family and, and to see you um, even remotely is a wonderful thing. Yes, it's, it's terrific. Um, you know, we're uh, recording this uh, on Wednesday, June 3rd. We're both in New York City. It's been uh, a difficult week uh, in many places around the country uh, and New York, um, absolutely. Um, you're okay and you're, you're safe, I trust? Yes, you know, I, I live in a little bit of paradise. Uh, I live in Sunnyside, which was built in the 20s as a utopian community for the workers in Long Island City. It was a socialist experiment. Um, Clarence Stein was one of the designers and he actually lived in the neighborhood. Um, they're modest, tiny little houses. Each house has a garden. So um, I feel so lucky um, we live in this kind of paradise um, which we share with the squirrels and a couple of raccoons. Um, but I feel so sad for the world, which is hurting so much now, and for our profession and our application, um, singing. Yes. Well, we'll get into that uh, maybe a, bit, a little bit later. Um, but let's talk about you and your association with BCI. Those of you, those of our choristers who have worked with you, certainly know your background, but for the benefit of those listeners today who may not have worked with you, can you give us a, a brief bio of yourself? Uh, how did you get involved in music as a profession? How did you work your way to being a conductor specifically? Well, um, I was lucky. I, I'm a Midwesterner. I was I was raised in Indiana. I'm a Hoosier. I'm a, a, a proud Hoosier, usually. Um, and I went to Indiana University. Um, and it was a time, it, it is such a wonderful school. And I studied with a piano virtuoso, the great Liszt pianist, um, George Bullett, and I was um, brought in to accompanying by one of my friends in the dormitory, um, Pam Sanabria, a wonderful soprano, and she said, I need a pianist at my lesson today. I said, well, I don't know anything about playing for singers. She said, you just come and sit. I don't care. Margaret Harshaw, my voice teacher, said she'll kick me out if I don't bring a pianist today. So um, that was it. I was hooked. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a nickname, a kind of cruel nickname, that they called Indiana University the graveyard of the Met um, because all these great singers would go there to teach after they had retired at the Met. And when I was there, um, Margaret Harshaw taught there, Eileen Farrell taught there for a while, Zinka Milanoff, mm -hmm. um, John Adangelo, on and on, Martha Lipton. And I learned so much sitting in those lessons. And George Bullett, my piano teacher, uh, knew early on that I was not going to be a piano virtuoso. But he, I brought him some music that I was playing for Pam, some Spanish music, Torina. And he helped me with it. And he came to the recital. And he came backstage afterwards. And he was a huge, imposing man, 6'2", pitch black hair. 
And he literally picked me up and shook me and said, why don't you play like that when you play like, when you play for me? Mm. And we, it was a light bulb moment. And we both realized I, I was a collaborative kind of guy and I enjoyed making music with other people. And um, he encouraged me to go into collaborative piano and said at one point, I see in your future, you being a conductor and um, <laughs> not a solo pianist. But that suited me completely because I love people. I love being around groups of people and I love singers and through that, um, I became a chorus master, um, first at the Santa Fe Opera, then the Canadian Opera Company, um, then New York City Opera. And I was so lucky. Um, luck has so much to do, doesn't it, Frank? Um, well, yes, being in the right place at the right time, if one has the requisite skills. Yes. Absolutely. But I felt so fortunate in having these incredibly, incredibly formative experiences with these very great singers, um, conductors that I assisted, and then people who said, you should be conducting. And then they said the magic words, we'll give you the opportunities to conduct. And you are part of that list because it was you um, were in one of the choruses that I prepared for something in New York, I think for um, the American Symphony Orchestra or maybe for the Phil, I don't remember. But then you hired me for BCI to do uh, a summer uh, project of... Um, opera excerpts. Yes, yeah, so that was 2000, <clears throat> and it was William Tell uh, excerpts, and Aida, and Mascagni Iris. Yes. Thank you for introducing that piece to me. It's absolutely beautiful music, none of which I knew before. Uh, and it was wonderful for me to be exposed to that uh, music for the first time. Yes. Any particular memories that you have of uh, that year at BCI? You know, you didn't know what to expect coming in to, you know, it was a group that had never met before, had never been together before. Any, any particular memories that stand out? Well, it, you know, at Santa Fe, um, I learned that you see a stream at the Santa Fe Opera Chorus is one of the great choruses in the world. Um, and I like to say um, Joyce Di Donato was one of my choristers. Uh, and I, I could make this long list of famous singers that were in my chorus. <laughs> um, so you see this stream, but the water is always new. And um, I think BCI is very similar to that because you have these people who come together with this incredible love of singing, uh, their own individual experiences, but they come together and they make this great chorus. So I think you see photos and pictures of BCI over the years and you see the BCI chorus, and there are some of the same members that come back year after year. Certainly, I've seen many of those members over the years. But then there are new people that keep coming and flowing through the stream. For me, um, that first year, um, well, it was so exciting. It was kind of at the beginning um, of my conducting career. I've kind of had... Several, I had a career as a pianist, as a collaborative pianist, and then as a chorus master, and then as a conductor. And that was really at the beginning of my um, conducting career. So 
it was very exciting and I loved it because um, I do a lot of Baroque music, a lot of earlier music, and there I was conducting Verdi and Mascagni and um, William Tell. I love telling people, um, I do a fair amount of Rossini, Barbara of Seville, and I've done a lot of Cenerentolas, and they say, oh, have you conducted any other Rossini? And I say, oh, yes, I've conducted William Tell. <laughs> and, and it's because of you and DCI that I've um, done that. Hey. And it was great. It was a wonderful, wonderful summer. And um, I, I have, in a place of honor, in my office, this amazing a gift that the chorus gave to me that summer wow. um, for Aida. And I treasure it. It's one of my um, favorite mementos and talismans. Mm -hmm. And all of those operas are very dear to me. Yes. And you've conducted for us in Santa Fe as well as Sheffield and in Austria as well. Uh, yes. Salzburg, and I remember you, you and Gary and I having a wonderful meal uh, in this grotto in Salzburg. It's yes, we, um, well, my, my husband, Larry, was my um, driver. And uh, we, had the, we had the most fun. And I don't know if you remember but um, Larry doesn't drive. Um, he only drives an automatic. And so we had, um, we had clearly stated this. And when we got to the rental place and you were there helping us, um, there was a long discussion. And in a typically Austrian way, very concerned people behind a closed glass door and shaking their heads. And we were so worried and we were the last people and you were so patient as you always are. Um, and they came out and we said, we're very sorry. We're very sorry, but there's been a horrible mistake. And we thought, oh dear, um, if we're going to have to have a stick shift, I don't think this is going to be a happy trip through Austria and Salzburg and Monse. And they said, um, it's our mistake. Would you, would you kindly accept, would you kindly accept a um, BMW convertible <laughs> for your week here? So we loved it because Larry was like James Bond in this incredible uh, black BMW. And when you and I were working, he was off exploring the lake region of um, Salzburg and it be a BMW convertible. It was it it was fantastic. <laughs> Well, you know, now for the most part, uh, you make your living as a um, as a freelancer. In other words, you don't have a group with which you work on a regular basis at at this point. Um, for the most part, um, can you talk a little bit about what that's like? First of all, before COVID nineteen, and, and we'll get into that in a moment. But you know, again, <clears throat> this idea of the stream here, your your every group you work with, you're meeting for the first time. And what some of your preparation might be and what some of your expectations might be when you go in to prepare an opera here, a concert here, that sort of thing. Yes, well, I, I was taught by wonderful maestri. Um, at the beginning of my career, I assisted in Boston. I was the associate conductor at Boston's Handel and Haydn Society when it was conducted by, when it was led by Tom Dunn, Thomas Dunn, who was a Handel uh, scholar and a marvelous conductor. And I was hired as the accompanist, harpsichordist, and librarian. And I naively thought being the librarian was 
passing out and collecting the scores. And then I realized um, that it meant marking the scores according to his directions. And he was a, um, he admitted he was an overmarker and um, every note had a mark. Some notes had three or four marks. Um, and at that point, um, in the last century, and he was doing early music, Bach, Handel, Haydn, um, it, it, and with modern instruments, I think players needed a lot of direction. So um, I learned, I feel that players today have been malarized we have been taught to play what we see. So we will play a note the way it has been marked. If it's got an accent, a staccato, um, a little bit faster here, a little bit slower here, we will follow those directions beautifully. And early music, which was his meat and potatoes is usually not marked at all. It's, there's an occasional forte, an occasional piano, but there are all these conventions that early music players know intimately um, and they would know immediately, oh, well, this is a bourree. So we should play it like this, and we should play it with short notes, and it should be this tempo, and it should be like this, and it should, these notes, because they're paired, should be slurred, etc., etc. So he would mark all of that very carefully. And that's something I've learned, and I have um, continued to do. I'm now on my third set of Messiah parts. Um, and they've changed completely from being, as he taught me, very overmarked to now being still marked a lot, but more gently marked because players today are different. They're more used to playing early music. They're, their players today are are more adventuresome, um, play a bigger cornucopia of styles. And um, so I try very hard to come often with my own parts. I have sets to about 30 or 40, I imagine, operas and oratorios. And I come with my own music. I often mark my chorus parts, which I send in advance. You know, speaking of, you just mentioned your third set of Messiah parts. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it's like to perform a piece, let's take Messiah, so many times? Uh, because I think uh, for a lot of our choristers who may have performed Verdi Requiem three or four times, or Brahms Requiem or something like that, or even parts of Messiah yeah, at home. Um, how does one keep it fresh? How much of it is in the music? How much of it is your current thinking vis-a-vis -vis what you may have thought 20 years ago? Uh, that sort of thing. Well, a piece like Messiah, part of it now is just in my DNA. Um, it's, it's, I, uh, you know, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Um, I, I think I would be hard pressed to do some things in Messiah differently. However, that said, um, I think it's my responsibility and it's certainly my heart's desire to every time I look at a piece of music and do a piece again, and some of these pieces, Messiah, um, Cenerentola, um, Handel operas, Giulio Cesare, I was just about to do that in Boston for Boston Lyric Opera. I've done that opera five times already. Um, when you do it again, 
you have to look at it as if you're doing it for the first time. There's always new information coming along. There are always new books, new studies. There are things you haven't read that are 50 years old. Um, there are new ways of looking at it. Um, and the wonderful thing about going to different places is you meet new musicians. And I, I am so keenly aware, and this is so true of choruses, you are just part of the mix. Um, a conductor is only part of the musical machine that's going to make the musical performance. So you're going to learn from the chorus and orchestra in front of you, if you allow yourself, yes. um, uh, how this music can go. And I'd, I, I don't want to dictate. I want to learn. I want to experience. I feel music is, uh, as I've said, a collaborative art form. And, and, and if you as the conductor are really listening and responding to what you hear, rather than just what is in your head or your, your current interpretation. Absolutely. One of my greatest compliments um, was the chorus master at City Opera, Jenny Stringer, came to me after a performance and said, thank you. She said, we, we love working with you because we sense in the pit that you're listening to mm -hmm. us. And I, it's, I treasure that so much. On one hand, I'm like, well, right, of course. <laughs> what else would I be doing? But I do understand that because as a conductor, of course, you have to have this vision of what you want it to sound like. Um, on the other hand, you have to hear what people around you are doing. And, and then somehow that, that has to all come together. And I think that's true among the different strata or levels of performers, you know, whether you're working with a volunteer chorus at BCI, the, uh, the chorus has never come together before, right? Has never been together. Or you're working with a, a chorus that you work with on a regular basis, or your students at Juilliard who are arguably among the most talented that exist, or, or professionals, you you know, when you conduct a Messiah at New York Philharmonic, for example, you know, there are these different levels of um, ability and uh, different levels of study that we've all had. Um, and you, by listening, create the performance. Yes, yes, yes. It's a, it's a miraculous thing. I, I feel, and I feel, and I've talked to many conductors about this. We've had many discussions about this. I feel part of my job is to disappear as a conductor. So the music can be there. So they're seeing Mascagni or George Frederick Handel, um, not me. Um, because, um, I, I mean, George Bolette used to say, um, he, he felt it was so important to have an idea, something to say about the music, because he belonged to a generation of conductors, uh, of pianists, sorry, of pianists who went to concerts to hear what Paderewski had to say ah. about Chopin, right. um, not to hear Chopin. Um, and I think there's a lot of truth about that. Um, you know, we are, we are so, again, we are so malarized in that we look at the urtext and we say, ah, this is the urtext of Handel and we can't change any note. Well, um, because I think I worked with George, I realized that that's just the the stepping off point. Yes, that's the road, um, that's the map. Yes. That's the map. 
and you have to choose where you're going to picnic, um, where you're going to speed through, where you're going to have a scenic outlook, um, right. and and that's where you can be expressive. It reminds me, years ago, I went to a piano recital uh, with some friends, and the pianist was technically really proficient. I mean, brilliant technically, and so unexpressive. And as we left, one of my friends said, I never heard so many right notes in my life. <laughs> exactly. And that's all it was. Can we talk a little bit, uh, you know, now getting into the situation in which, which we all face, um, uh, that musical performances and some organizations have uh, shut down temporarily uh, as we all uh, react to COVID-19. And, and again, you as a freelancer, I would imagine that most of your work has really dried up uh, recently. Uh, you know, what's that been like for you? Any ideas where you see us going, um, how you're reacting to it? Um, yes. Well, I, I have to state at the beginning that I'm an optimist, um, which is kind of hard to be right now. Um, I feel a little battered at times, um, but um, I feel so supported by my colleagues. Um, in Salt Lake City with Utah Opera, we made it to the final dress rehearsal. And then that evening of the dress rehearsal, we were canceled at six o'clock by the governor of the state, and which I completely understand. But, um, and the Boston Lyric Opera, um, those performances were canceled of Giulio Cesare, Today, I should be in uh, at Des Moines Metro Opera, um, which is actually in Indianola, Iowa, um, rehearsing Rameau's Plate. Um, that's been canceled. But I must say, all of these organizations have paid either a cancellation fee or the full fee. That, to me, is unheard of um, because... Yeah. It's, it's incredible um, because in our contracts, there's an act of God clause, which allows them not to pay us. Um, but it's, and I am of a certain generation and many of my colleagues are much younger and just starting out. The barber cast, um, it was the Rosinas and the barbers first um, oh, it was time for that mm. And um, it was so sad um, because, oh my God, they sang the pants off those roles. Uh, they just had the most amazing voices and stage presence. But I feel um, keenly this is a pause. It's a fermata. And if you look at history, um, opera, choral singing, music has come back after wars. It's come back after plagues. It's um, come back after bankruptcies. Um, everything we've... Sur I was working at City Opera during 9-11. And um, we... Uh, 9-11 was to have been opening of our season. And I was standing in the doorway with my briefcase and um, a, my tuxedo ready to leave the house when Larry said, you better turn on the TV because something's going on. Mm -hmm. And I stood there for an hour with both in my hands. And then we didn't open for, I think, three days. And um, we opened with um, Mikado. Mm. And um, then finally, the opera we had planned to open with Dutchman and Magic Flute and 
um, and, and, and. But I feel it's, um, I know, I used to say, um, sorry, I used to say singing is so healthy. Singers live longer. Um, it's all the endorphins, it's the breathing, it's the joy you get from singing that will make you live longer. And of course, now we're learning that singers are super spreaders. Um, singing in a chorus is a dangerous um, um, occupation or a dangerous um event um but all of that is just temporary yes um and and we're going to move through this and um singing is primal we have to sing we have to express ourselves and and it's not only expressing ourselves which is so important but it is such a communal atmosphere when one sings and there are so many studies done about how people who sing in choruses are more community and civic minded and active within their communities. And we just look forward to seeing one another. <laughs> Amen. So I agree with you. We will figure this out. I was speaking with one of our other conductors, Tom Hall, who said, you know, somebody will figure this out. Somebody will invent something. Somebody will come up with an idea that we haven't yet heard of to help us all get back together. It's a question of when, not if. Right, right, absolutely. And I think it's like you look at World War I, World War II, um, out of those wars, which were so catastrophic and horrible, came wonderful things, um, sonar, um, radio, x-rays, um, advances in air flight. Um, we are having so many problems. Um, I know you've taught online um, at, at Manus, and I've coached and taught, and we're doing a, a gala for Boston Lyric Opera with everybody remotely. Oh, it's a horrible pain in the you-know-what. Um, but I feel out of that, someone right now is inventing better ways for us all to communicate remotely. Um, and I agree with Tom Hall, um, who, by the way, Tom and I are both disciples of Tom Dunn. Tom yes. Dunn. Yeah. And we grew up together in musically in Boston. Um, but it's, um, we are going to continue this great primal um, experience. And, and young people are going to, one of the things that has buoyed me over the years is that this is not an art form that um, is dying out. Um, young people are forming choruses, a cappella groups, quartets, um, their high school Broadway productions are thriving. Um, young people, I teach at Juilliard, I hear young singers all the time. Um, there is nothing wrong with the supply side. The supply side is just strong, and these people are enthusiastic. So it, it, they're going to find the way. And I feel now people are being cautious. Um, people are being pessimistic because that's the safest thing. I live in New York City. I wear my mask. I um, am cautious about going out. I limit trips to the grocery store. But that's because I want to come through on the other side to, to sing in a chorus, to conduct a chorus, to make music communally. Well, I think that's a great place to leave things with hope for the future, which we all have. Gary, thank you so much for talking with me today. Uh, for those of you who are listening, we're going to continue on um, 
for any questions and answer uh, questions that you might have and answers that we may have. So we may. <laughs> thank you, Frank. <laughs>